Let me tell you something. It's great that you love God, but if you don't have a revelation on how much God loves you, then you don't have no power. Knowing that God loves you has a lot to do with living a life that's fear-free. Matter of fact, I can pretty much venture to say that until you have not just head knowledge about the love of God, but a real revelation that God loves you, you're not going to be able to deal with the fears that will come into your life. That was certainly the case with me. It's amazing we throw the word love around in church and it's just really almost pathetic how much we talk about love and how little of it we really know anything about. Matter of fact, the word Christianity and love, if you look up, if you look up, look it up in the Greek dictionary, that's just what Christians are supposed to do, you know, that's just you love. You love God because He first loved you. You receive His love. You love yourself in a balanced way. You love other people. That's what we do. We love. That should be the main theme of our life. Getting our own way and getting everything we want should not be the main theme of our life. Love should be the main theme of our life. Verse 16, 1 John 4, 16. There's a handful of scriptures in the Bible that I can say have been very life-changing to me, and I love all of the Word, but there's a few that I could pull out and say, man, this was like a major life-changing thing in my life, and this, this scripture was one of them. We know, understand, recognize, and are conscious of, by observation and by experience, a lot of words there, but I want you to hold on to them. And we believe, adhere to, put faith in, and rely on the love that God cherishes for us. Now, what is that really saying? He's saying that in order to really know the love of God, we need to experience it for ourselves. The Apostle Paul talked about that also in Ephesians chapter 3. He said that you may know the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the love that God has for you, and that you might experience it for yourself. And he said, we need to observe it. He said, we get to know this love by observation and by experience. Now, I would like to challenge you to take a little notebook. The Bible actually talks about a book of remembrance that God keeps. <clears throat> And I think sometimes we need to keep one too, where we just jot down little special things that God does for us. Because so often all we think about is what God doesn't do for us. And I tell you, there's not a person in this room that God is probably not just showing out in your life. And yet you miss most of it because you're unconscious. <laughs> he says we need to be conscious and aware of the love of God. For example, this morning, and I've learned to do this over the years, and it's just, it's just a beautiful thing. It just has helped me more than I even know how to say. My husband came to me this morning, and Dave's a very kind man, and he, get, you know, he, he compliments me on a pretty regular basis. But this morning, he came to me, and he put his arms around me, and he said, your, your testimony was on television this morning. And he said, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you, how honored I am to be married to you, and how much I love you. Put his arms around me and hugged me, and he said, I think you're very special. Now, see, that was, that was great that God did that, and I really, that Dave did that, and I really appreciated Dave doing it, but I also knew that it was more than Dave. I knew that God was loving me through Dave. I knew that part of that was God getting me ready to come and minister to you, because I had an especially difficult day yesterday dealing with some stuff 
that I won't get into but was especially hard. God wants you to start paying attention to how much He loves you. And for every little, teeny, tiny, even seemingly insignificant thing that He does for you. If God gets me a good parking place, I thank Him. <laughs> This is how you learn to have an intimate relationship with God. You pay attention to what God is doing in your life. When you go to a store and you didn't even know they had a coupon, and you're trying to buy something, the clerk says, oh, do you have the coupon out of the paper? And you say, no, I didn't even know there was a coupon. And she pulls one out from under the counter and gives you a coupon to get 20% off. That's God loving you. Now, I know the world would say, well, that's coincidence. But I don't believe that. I believe it's God loving you. They say, well, the same thing happens to me. Well, I believe it's God loving them too. They're just too dumb to know it. <laughs> Amen? You've got to learn how good God is to you. And sometimes God can even be good to you through somebody that's not even such a great person. They don't even know what they're doing. There was an atheist and a Christian that lived next door to each other. And the Christian was having some financial problems, went out on her porch one day and lifted up her face to heaven and said, oh God, please send me food. The atheist stuck his head out the window and said, there is no God. Next morning, the woman opened her door and there was bags of groceries on her front porch. She looked up to heaven and said, oh God, thank you, thank you for sending me food. The atheist jumped out from behind a bush and said, God didn't send you that food, I put it there. She looked up to heaven one more time and said, God, thank you for sending me food and making the devil pay for it. How many of you think that we pay more attention to what God doesn't do than we pay to what God does do? Amen? Amen? People want to know that God loves them. Because verse 18 says, perfect love casteth out fear. For fear hath torment. But when you know that the perfect one loves you perfectly, completely, totally, and unconditionally. Yes, I said perfectly, completely, totally and unconditionally, and yes, I'm talking to you. And I'm talking to every one of you watching by TV. God loves everybody, but He loves you, and you need to take it personally. And what does that mean? That means that God is with you, and He's for you, and He's got a good plan for your life, and you don't have to live in fear. You don't have to be afraid of the past, afraid of the future, afraid of loneliness, afraid of lack. Because fear hath torment. And God has not called us to be tormented. Now, we're going to read verse 16 again because I think you'll get it a little better now. We know, we understand, we recognize, and we're conscious of. See, don't be unconscious of the love of God. <laughs> Be conscious of it all day long. Oh, God, thank you for loving me in that situation. Thank you, God, for that favor. Thank you. Every compliment you get, you need to thank God for it. Every single time that somebody gives you any kind of a compliment, you ought to thank God for it. Thank God for every little thing that He does, and the more grateful you get, the more God will do. If you're already complaining about what you got, why should God give you something else to complain about? <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> Let me tell you, I sure love the word, how it sets people free. You know, there are people that just hearing tonight that God loves them 
is going to change their life. Because after all, isn't that what everybody wants? Love and acceptance. We want to be accepted the way we are and love where we're at. We want somebody that'll stick with us and help us go all the way through to the end. And believe. We know, understand, recognize, and are conscious of by observation and by experience and believe, adhere to, and put faith in and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. It's not something He does, turns on and off, that's who He is. And He who dwells and continues in love dwells and continues in God, and God dwells and continues in Him. Now, let's back up for a minute to verse 12. This is another scripture that was very, very, very life-changing to me. You know, we all want to be in the presence of God. We love that, that sensing, that feeling of being in God's presence. And I've read many books about the presence of God and living in the presence of God and dwelling in the presence of God. But sometimes we can almost get a little bit overly spiritual. And we just get this, ooh. Do you feel him? Is he here? <laughs> and I came across this one morning and this settled it for me. No man has at any time yet seen God. But if we love one another, God abides. So where is God? God is in love. Because he is love. And all love starts with God. There is no love, no real love without God. There can be a gooey romantic feeling, but not real love. God is love. And God loves us. And He wants us to love ourselves. And He wants us to love Him. And He wants us to love other people. And the Bible says that we should learn to live and dwell and remain in that love. I know this is not something we normally major in, so we're kind of like, It'd be amazing what would happen if you just start getting up every day, saying, thank you, God, for loving me. I love you. I love myself. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about a selfish, self-centered dope. I'm talking about, like, loving the who that you are, that God has created you to be. And, Lord, I'm just going to go out today, and I'm going to love everybody I can. I just want to ooze <laughs> with love. And I can tell you that's better than going and sitting in a room somewhere and going. <laughs> and I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. I'm just saying that, you know, what we think God is and what He really is. See, I'm not belittling anything about God by saying we, that God wants to be on a practical level with us. Everything about the Word is not some floating in the clouds, spiritual, hard to understand thing. God is love. He loves you. He wants you to love you. He wants you to love Him. He wants you to love other people. And when we are dwelling and abiding in love, God is there. And I don't know what you think about my message tonight, but this is God's favorite message. He's all over this thing. When I started Joyce Meyer Ministries, which at the time was not called that, it was called Life in the Word. It was at a church in St. Louis, and it started as a women's meeting. I just prayed so hard, God, what do you want me to teach this very first meeting that I have? What do you want me to teach? I was going to have a Thursday morning meeting, a ladies meeting at a church in St. Louis. And he said, I want you to tell my people how much I love them. And I thought, I argued with God. I said, God, I don't want to go with a little three John 3.16 Sunday school message. <laughs> Everybody knows that you love them. And he said, no, if they did, they'd act a lot different than what they do. <laughs> what do you think of that? 
If we really knew that God loved us unconditionally, oh my gosh, things would change so differently. Worry would leave, anxiety would leave, stress would go, fear would go, insecurity would go. <laughs> so many things are solved by knowing the love of God. Now, let's look at the disciple John for a moment. This guy had an attitude that is absolutely amazing. John, of course, wrote the book of John. <laughs> and in the book of John, there are five times that John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> Now, I just have got a feeling that that grated on the other disciples because he said it even to them. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. We're going to look at the references. I want you to see this. Let's start in John 13, 23. Because I'll tell you, there's a message in this. You go look at yourself in the mirror tomorrow morning and say, God loves me. See what it does for your day. Instead of waking up thinking about rehearsing with the devil everything you did wrong your whole life and what a rotten no good you are and all the guilt and the condemnation. Come on now. You say, God loves me, and I am the righteousness of God in Christ. God's got a good plan for my life, and I'm expecting something good to happen to me today. Yeah. Woo! And you don't just do it once. You keep it up and keep it up and keep it up and keep it up and keep it up till you give the devil a breakdown. You need to be the kind of Christian when you put your feet on the floor in the morning, every devil in hell crawls back into their hole and screams, they're out of bed again. John 13, 23. I mean, I really believe there is a great, great lesson in this. One of his disciples whom Jesus loved, <laughs> whom he esteemed and delighted in. And John's writing the book. And he's talking about himself. Was reclining next to him on Jesus' bosom. <laughs> you know, John, he just hung out. Jesus loves me, this I know. <laughs> Now, Peter, on the other hand, he was always talking about how much he loved God. <laughs> Come on now. Oh, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. <laughs> Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Third time, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. It said, it, it, It bothered him that Jesus asked him three times the same thing. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Except Peter was the one that denied him. Not once, three times. All John did was talk about how much Jesus loved him, and they couldn't kill him. He lived longer than all the other disciples. I'm told that they tried to boil him in oil and couldn't even kill him. Let me tell you something. It's great that you love God, but if you don't have a revelation on how much God loves you, then you don't have no power. Don't let anything separate you from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus. Nothing threatening, nothing impending, no sin that you've committed in your life. Let nothing separate you from the love of God. Neither life nor death nor things impending nor threatening. Nothing in all the world can ever separate me from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus. Let nothing separate you. Did you hear what I said? Don't let your own sin separate you from the love of God. The minute we sin, we shrink back in our holes. We want to run back to Egypt. 
No, all God says you need to do is admit it, confess it, take ownership of it, don't make excuses for it, don't blame it on anybody else, receive your forgiveness, shake it off, and go on. If you're going to waste 10 weeks feeling guilty, you're just wasting God's time. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus tenderly loved. <laughs> and said, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. John 21 verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved. Can you imagine writing a book? I mean, what do you think would happen if I wrote a book and five times in that book referred to myself as Joyce, the disciple whom Jesus loved? I mean, I would be written up in every Christian magazine that I could possibly be written up in as some kind of a heretic and a prideful, fanatical, crazy woman. And John keeps doing it over and over and over and over. John was also the disciple who was asked to take care of Jesus' mother. I think there's something special in that too. He knew because of the loving relationship that he had with him that John would be good to his mom. The disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. Pretty amazing, don't you think? Everybody say, God loves me. God loves me. Now I want you to say it a little different. Say, God loves me. Perfect love casts out fear. God is love. He has a good plan for your life. You don't have to live in fear. If God be for me, who can be against me? If God is on my side, whom shall I fear? Fear not, for I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. For lo, I will be with you always even unto the ends of the earth. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Father, I pray for every person here tonight that has not experienced and been conscious and aware of Your love. I don't want this just to be a message. I'm asking you, by your Holy Spirit, to take this and make it a revelation in people's lives. Enough of a revelation that it will drive fear out of their lives. Let this be a beginning, a foundation for people to not have to live in fear. I pray that this would be a new day, a day of boldness, a day of courage, a day of new beginnings. A day to let go of what lies behind and face the future courageously. We thank you, God, for your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if we truly understand just how much God loves us, then we can know beyond a doubt that we don't need to live in fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind.
Well, as you can see, I'm holding twins, and they are one month old, but they are severely malnourished. And actually, I've just been told that there's hope for them, but we have to be able to feed the mother so she can allow them to nurse as well as feed the babies. There were twins here yesterday, but one of them had all had, had uh, died because of malnourishment. But we can save these, and you're helping us do that. They are so sweet, but they are so tiny, so tiny. Thank you so much for helping us make a difference in the lives of these people here in Ethiopia. Miss deze kans niet om Joyce Meyer live te zien. Well, I'm really excited about my first ever conference in the Netherlands. Uitdagende voordrachten. Inspirerende muziek van Hillsong London. Be part of this life-changing event. In Ahoy Rotterdam op zaterdag 9 mei 2015. Tickets zijn verkrijgbaar via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bij Primera. Iedere dag worden we door vele stemmen, gedachten en meningen overspoeld. Hoe kunnen we erachter komen wat God ons door bepaalde levensvragen en dagelijkse uitdagingen zeggen wil? Joyce Meyer legt in dit boek uit op welke verschillende manieren God met je kan communiceren. Bestel nu... Hoe je Gods stem kunt horen, telefonisch op 026 20 22 100 of bezoek onze website joyce-maier.nl.